Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is it okay? All right. Well, I'm excited to be here today. I just want to get a feel for who's in the audience. Can you just uh, maybe raise hands or let me know? Any folks from the business school here? Uh, anyone from the IS program? Okay, uh, other schools like engineering. Oh, excellent. Life sciences. Um, what else? What else? What am I missing? Fine arts. Fine arts, excellent. Yeah. Math. Philosophy. Philosophy. Okay, I have a couple of jokes I could tell about math. <laughs> I was, uh, so I was at Purdue University. My brother-in-law is a professor at Purdue, and I was one of those weird parties with students and professors, and ran into this kid who's getting a PhD in math. I said, well, what the heck are you going to do with that, you know? And, you know, I'm trying to make conversation, not be too much of an idiot. And I said that. And he said, uh, computer security. And I said, you're right. That's hot. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, so anyway, uh, other majors, I just want to say the best boss I ever had was a special ed major. And she thought it was an excellent background for managing an IT group, which included me into it. <laughs> and one of the best people I had working for me, uh, becoming an IT leader, was an interior design major. So, and I do want to remind you that Carly Fiorina, who headed HP, uh, ran for political office, was a medieval history major, okay? So IT has a big tent in it, and uh, there's, more, there's more room than just for computer scientists or programmers. So there's lots of needs. There's sales, running big organizations, and even doing IT strategy, which is what I did. So today, uh, I want to do a little bit, uh, talk about my background. Um, I want to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship as I saw it in my career. Steve is right. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, but I saw a lot of entrepreneurs. And I worked with them, helping them grow their business. We partnered up to solve my business problems. I watched how they do things, how they did things. And I watched their companies and grow and evolve. And I watched my business my business's needs change. And um, one of the things I love to do is IT strategy, so I developed some courses on that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I'll talk about where we are right now, our current business and technology environments. I'll run through some of those entrepreneurial examples I talked about, and we'll go through some conclusions. OK, so me. So I gave you all the, the weird majors. So my major is uh, I have an undergraduate degree in physics. And uh, this is what I wanted to be when I grew up. Right? So I'm a Trekkie, and I always wanted to be Mr. Spock, right? I didn't want to be Captain Kirk. He was the crazy guy. He got into trouble. I wanted to be the rational, hear the facts. Oh, well, look at this interesting chart here. I think we ought to do this. Anyway, that was me. But what I actually did is I uh, did ROTC in college and uh, went to the Air Force and went to the Space Defense Center where I did Earth orbiting satellites. And this is actually uh, a picture here. I'm just going to check out my pointer. Oh, there it is of the entrance to the tunnel up in Shine Mountain outside of Colorado Springs. And this was 1,000 feet above uh, Colorado Springs, uh, you know, flat area. I used to run out of that tunnel a couple of times a week down to the bottom and back up. So I was a lot lighter then than I am now. Um, while I was in the Air Force, uh, I also started working on a master's degree in, in business management. Uh, completed that there in Colorado Springs. And then uh, my last year in the Air Force, I was assigned to a remote uh, radar facility. This is a big six-story uh, phase array radar site uh, closer to mainland Russia than the United States. And I spent a year here. And I actually commanded a crew <coughs> that uh, worked in that facility while it was on duty. And our mission was to track uh, Earth orbiting satellites, but our primary mission was looking for incoming ICBMs into the United States. So I spent a year there. And then after that, separated from the Air Force and trying to figure out what to do next. And I remember very succinctly sitting on this island doing pros and cons of my next steps. And one of the things I had started doing, I'd started dinking around with the computers here, doing a little bit of programming, a little bit of uh, working the radar. I would set up some of the radar configurations for certain missile launches and things like that. And I thought computer science would be a good um, career field. And I said, hey, I'm switching. You know, I've got a good undergrad. You know, I learned how to think and learned about a lot of things. But what am I going to do next? 
And I said, I think computing is going to go somewhere. I think I have uh, some talent I could use in that area, you know, based on the type of things I like to do. So I came back to BYU and started coursework through toward a master's degree in computer science. So I took courses for two semesters, completed all the required undergraduate semesters, and then made the biggest mistake in my life, okay? It, and that was, I didn't go for that. I didn't complete it. So I invested a year, I had about another year, year and a half or so to do it, and I didn't do it. Now, you know, things work out okay, and sometimes you make good turns, sometimes not so good turn. This is a turn I wish I could have, uh, if I had to do again, I would have stuck with it. But things worked all right anyway. Um, I became a software developer, uh, first here in Provo, worked for a company uh, south of Provo doing uh, 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 computer-aided graphics uh, design for large steel structures. Left there, went to the research triangle down in North Carolina and started doing computer integrated manufacturing systems for a large telecommunications equipment manufacturer. We were in North Carolina for five years and then I moved to the Chicago area and had uh, probably one of the, if this was a bad career decision, this was a good career decision and I got into life sciences in computing with, with life sciences companies. And life sciences are large pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies. And that's what I finally wound up working for was a large pharmaceutical company, biotech company in the Chicago area. Okay. All right, so I'm a retired IT executive from Fortune 100 in the uh, Chicago area, and Steve read a few of the things that I did. One of the things I'm, some of the things I'm proud of is launching, launching our first e-commerce website, and uh, again, that was a great experience, but I also had one of my worst experiences there. And I teach an IT strategy course right at two universities, and I always tell my students and people that work for me, because large computer systems are very complex, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And when people would come and complain to me, and I said, uh, okay, do you feel like throwing up in the trash can and running out of the building? No. I said, you're okay. <laughs> because I felt like that when we launched our e-commerce website, and we were up and down for several weeks until we finally figured out our, um, our problem. And our problem was around web services. We were using uh, technology similar to what Amazon uses for web services, and we had just some minor glitches. But it took a few weeks, and we worked it out. Um, before I retired, I developed uh, uh, a, a series of course ideas for Northwestern University in, mass, in their Masters in Computer Information Systems and, and develop, actually developed one of those courses in IT strategy. So I did that there at Nor Northwestern. I'd been teaching that class for about five years with them. I brought that class to the University of Utah, and it's called IT Strategy and Leadership there and teaching their master's program up there. I do Northwestern once a year and University of Utah uh, one, uh, once a year. So after I retired, came back to Utah. It's a beautiful place. We uh, you know, had a great time out here. Uh, wanted to live back here you know, in the climate and the geography. And I also wanted to come back to Silicon Slopes. You know, I was really excited about that. I still uh, view myself as a technology guy. I wanted to be involved in the action out here. So came back, uh, joined the Rollins Center here, uh, met a lot of great entrepreneurs and people, uh, joined the Boom Startup Organization where I, I get to meet and mentor startup companies, joined the Park City Angels, um, a lot of uh, interesting uh, guys up there. Uh, we have a great time looking at companies. It's really, you know, a lot of these folks are retired and have a lot of great industry experience. They love uh, meeting and working with startups, do a lot of investing there. The technologies I've chose to work with or it's, it's worked out is either an advisor level um, type of relationship or an investor relationship. So I have several companies that are Internet of Things, one AI company, and just about two months ago I started working with a blockchain company here in, in the area and I'm really excited about that. Okay, so we look at, uh, once a month, we look at about six or seven deals. Out of that, we pick three deals to come to the general membership. So there's kind of a screening meeting. We get three deals at the general me membership, so that would be about 36 deals a year. And out of that, uh, I would say, you know, it's, it's hard for me to quote, quote me, but 
between five-ish deals are actually funded. And the average funding would be anywhere from 100,000 to a couple of 300,000, okay? All right, so just to, before I finish too much of my history, I did wanna uh, recognize some of the things. And I said, uh, I, I was up front, I had the opportunity to be up close with some great achievers. And it started here at BYU when I, t I was taking those computer science classes. And I had as my instructors, uh, Alan Ashton and Bruce Bastian for uh, assembly language programming class, okay? And Bruce was a hard driver and expected perfection. But Alan and Bruce were actually building a word processor for the city of Orem on a data general mini computer in the evenings, okay? Well, after I left, they ported that to an IBM PC and launched WordPerfect. So these were the founders of WordPerfect. One day I'm sitting in a lecture hall similar to this, smaller with a chalkboard. Ray Norda came in, drew up, drawn up on his boards his ideas for uh, uh, operating systems, distributed operating systems, uh, server-based operating systems, and that, he was the founder of uh, Novell. Uh, at that time, they had professors do their last lecture, so it wasn't their real last lecture, but if you were doing your last lecture, what would you talk about? So to hear Stephen R. Covey give his last lecture. But by this time, Stephen R. had already written uh, Spiritual Roots of Human Relations, which I had read, but he had not written Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So it was interesting to catch him at that time in his life, hear some of his ideas that, that he actually later published in that book, Seven Habits. Too busy to meet. So throughout my career, we had Steve Gates come to my company, and, I mean, sorry, Bill Gates. Uh, so Bill came down, he was kind of a cult hero at that time, you know, if you were following the PC uh, industry. But a lot of our senior IT execs at that time were too busy to come hear Bill talk. So myself and about 50, 60 other people huddled in the conference room, smaller than this, but had a kind of an intimate meeting with Bill and, and listened to what his plans were. We were all excited. Steve Jobs called up uh, my friend, a friend of mine at work, and this was between his Apple engagements when he was doing Next and he was trying to sell his hardware and operating system for use in our medical equipment. So it was kind of interesting. Frank DeSosa, you folks probably don't know Frank, but I'll tell you about Frank later. But again, came in, hosted him, spent a day with him at our company, actually spent quite a bit of time with him. A lot of our senior IT leaders too busy to meet, to meet but Frank turned out to be a real innovator. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about entrepreneurship, but a, another approach. And uh, it's kind of where I've seen entrepreneurs work from my viewpoint, which is big corporate IT, okay? So enterprise systems, systems that run large companies. All right, so the big idea. So how does it work? What do you learn, okay? You get some room in your parents' garage, maybe a basement, right? Huddle around, think about it come up with a big idea, stir it up, work hard, spend some time, make a bundle of money, right? Okay, so that's certainly a legitimate path, okay? But it's not all of entrepreneurship. I wanna, the idea I wanna talk today, you have big business, problems, needs. They need technology, they need business process, they need, they buy small companies, right? You look at the most of the big, uh, look at IBM. $20 billion, I believe, is the number they spent on uh, analytics, uh, ac acquiring companies that had business and business, uh, uh, that had developed businesses in data analytics, okay? So that's how they were doing their innovation. Big biotech companies buy really small biotech companies. So you learn about these opportunities by working and being in industry, okay? So my proposal is you're in there, you're in the field, you're working in business and industry, you get an idea, you produce some innovation, you make a bunch of money, okay? So I wanna talk about the second approach today, which I consider, both of these are very legitimate, okay? But all of you are not gonna have the great ideas sitting around here at university, okay? You may have to get out into the field. You may be out in the field working for a big company or working for a business process, uh, in a business process or some industry that can use some innovation. And I'm gonna talk about some of the drivers of that innovation. So, and I'm gonna, so I'm gonna start right now talking about where are we now and where are we going? In other words, what's your environment? So, you know, uh, I was once your age, but you've never been my age, right? 
So I've seen a lot of things happen and I'm going to give you that perspective of what I've seen change and what's very unique and exciting about the time that you guys are living in. Okay, so throughout the ages, work and wealth, all right? So uh, I, got, I got this picture, um, but it starts out with a hunter-gatherer. So what's a source of wealth for a hunter-gatherer? I assume it's just brute strength, okay? And, but what happens when we go to become an agrarian society? What are the sources of wealth? How do you acquire and increase your wealth? It's land-based, okay? You have to have land to grow things, right? That becomes your source of wealth. If you're in an industrial age, which, you know, kind of was the, the era that I grew up in, what's your source of wealth? It's capital. You need a lot of money to create big factories, to buy big equipment, to have those big processes to produce goods, okay? But the age we're in now is called the information age, and you can, you know, do some nuances there, but the idea is what do you need now to generate wealth in the age that we live in? It's ideas, it's knowledge, it's ability, okay? You don't need land, you can get capital. In fact, investors, and I've been really, I wouldn't say shocked or surprised, but I've been amazed at how many investors I've run into into the, the area here. I mean, I've met most of the venture capitalists, I've met a lot of the angel investors. There's money waiting there, and you know, I already kind of shared, you know, the number of uh, investors we support as a Park City Angels group, but the venture capitalists here, they're supporting more. So what are the, why do the venture capitalists have money? Why are they in there? They're in there to make money. So you have individuals with money that want to grow their funds at a faster than normal rate. So what are they looking at? Well, more often than not, they're looking now at this era and they're not looking for somebody that comes in with a lot of equipment, with a lot of capital, but they are looking for people that have knowledge, ideas, and ability, okay? And, and if I were to say, if I were to just try to partition it out, how much is it the idea and how much is it the entrepreneur that those investors are investing in? A bigger percentage than you think is the individual entrepreneur. Is this person gonna stick with it? Do they have the chutzpah? Do they, are they gonna gut it out? Are they gonna be able to make the tough decisions to drive a business, okay? So we're in this, in this era of, you know, ideas and knowledge are, are key wealth generators. What else is unique about the era that we're growing in? Well, we're in an era now where knowledge is doubling about every year, okay? In the early 1900s, knowledge doubled about every century. So you could learn a trade or a craft or something and be relatively secure that throughout your lifetime, things weren't going to change that much. You were an educated person. Your craft was going to be usable. 1940s, knowledge double about every 25 years. And now every year. And then 2020, at least, you know, this article here, you know, maybe every 12 hours. So we, we, we're in, a, in an era of unprecedented change, of rapid change, of accelerating change, okay? So, and then the final thing is we're also in an age of disruption. And these, uh, this idea of disruption is borrowed from, is a term coined by Clayton Christensen and describes a process by which a product or service takes root initially in a simple application at the bottom of a market and then relentlessly moves up market, eventually displacing established companies. I have seen this play out many times now, okay? So you think someone starts, um, you have uh, companies up here, okay, servicing their best clients, okay? So I'm thinking of IBM, all right? So IBM, typically uh, the company where I was, I had three or four or five IBM engineers on site at all times, working with us on software, hardware problems, had a dedicated sales team, two or three salespeople, they bring in specialists. And so we were a high value customer and they had their, um, their, their client team with us. Well, that was very expensive, okay? So in order to do that, what did IBM have to do? They had to maintain a high margin business. They had to maintain relatively high prices. And what did that leave open down here? Okay. Um, so 
IBM and other companies like that with, you know, that, that service the high end of the market, they're susceptible to new products and service coming in at the low end of the market. Now, think of the PC when it came into the market, okay? Was it as capable as mainframe computers? No. You know, we're kind of viewed like toys. Guys like me, we bought one for home, right, because we wanted our own computing platform, but we put up with a lot of hassles, okay? But eventually, that PC architecture got better and better. Oops. Okay. Where am I pointing wrong? Uh, let's see, my clicker. Oh, okay. All right, thank you, thank you. All right, so, um, so eventually those PCs got better and better and better, and let's just think of, uh, okay, so you had t PCs, you had them on your desktop, you got a server, you're able to com communicate through a server, people started building relatively low-end systems for doing some work group type of applications, uh, you got then client server technology and now we have web page technology to where you know the PC client the mobile client the, Where's the mainframe the mainframe's gone now? We've got a new technology coming which is cloud computing But you can see where this disruption and how a, a new new technology has taken root and displaced a lot of folks that were players uh, up here at the high end Okay, so here's just an example of some disruptors um, and the thing that was disrupted. So I talked a little about personal computers disrupting mainframe and mini computers. We can do uh, you know, cell phones uh, uh, disrupting fixed line telephony. So I just built a house. We don't have any fixed line telephones in the house. We just use all cell phones. In fact, I just want to share this funny picture. So this is my four-year-old son. Uh, they want, I'll make my grandson. They went on a family trip this weekend. They stopped at a hotel. This is him in the hotel room, and he says, Mom, is this an old-fashioned phone? Okay? I mean, I still look at that like a reasonable telephone, but he's never seen one like that in his life. Okay? So that's how quickly things are, are disrupting. Okay, now, what ha else has happened is businesses, their lifespans have shortened, right? Their business models, the products they uh, build and supply are, are relevant for a shorter period of time. So this chart here shows, uh, and this is a, a chart that's for 2012, built in 2012. So, you know, it's changed a little bit since then, but this is the best chart I have. So an average company lifespan in the S&P 500, okay? You can see back in the day in the 1960s, 1970s, you know, when I was growing up, my dad was working, I went to college. You could get a career in a company, okay? You know, 80 years, man, you could get two generations through a company, okay? While it was still viable, okay? Um, okay, moving on, 30 years, okay, that's pretty good. Okay, but what's happening out here? Now you're starting to look at uh, 20 years. Oh, you're starting to look at about 15 years, maybe 18 years. That's not a career, right? Now, you know, there's always going to be exceptions to this. But the idea is that business models, products, and services are relevant for a less period of time. Why? Because they're being disrupted by new technologies, new business processes, which are being fed by this rapid increase in technology innovation and knowledge, which is driving entrepreneurs who have the ability to use that new technology and knowledge to drive new business processes and new business, and guess what? The barriers to entry for them, getting funded is easier, okay? So you see all of this stuff coming together, okay? That's why you live in a, in a special time. There's good and bad things here. The bad thing is you probably won't work for a company for 30-something years, okay? You'll probably change companies' careers, um, you know, during, during your, your working life. In fact, one of the exercises I do in my class is always go to, because it's careers and job titles, okay? So I always go to, well, what was their job title when I knew them? What's their job title now, okay? So I'll just give you an example. So one is job title when I knew them, project manager in the data center. Job title now, 
in charge of cybersecurity for our medical devices, okay? Um, project manager in the data center, IBM cloud consultant, okay? Those job titles were not around 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but they're new jobs, they're new needs. So all this change is going on. So my point is, these are great times for entrepreneurs. Here's a final example on the S&P 500 chart. And again, you can see this is 2012 chart. So here are companies uh, that entered the index right here, and here are companies that exited the, the index, okay? So again, you know, the S&P 500 is, you know, large companies, but it does show you the trends. So you can see the kind of the new tech companies and the old companies that either, either disappeared, were purchased, acquired, or, or went out of business. Oh, by the way, if you have questions while we're going along, please feel free to ask. So we have plenty of time. Okay, so where are we now? We're in an age of rapidly growing knowledge and rapidly changing technologies. Established companies and business models must be adaptable or they will fade away and die, okay? So you've got companies that are nervous, CEOs that are nervous, because they know this, they believe it, they see the statistics, they see the number, they do not want to be the next victim. So they're looking to ways to innovate. So in my IT strategy classes, I always say an IT is a key way for them to innovate, okay? Because we can help update, build, new business processes, we can help them build new products and services that are wrapped with information technology, and that's going to help them survive, okay? New companies based on new technologies and adaptable and new business models will be created, hopefully by some of you, and rewarded with growth as they meet customer needs. It, we're in an age of disruptive business models and technologies. What does this mean for the entrepreneur? Opportunity. What does it mean for existing businesses? Necessity. They have to change, they have to grow, or they're gonna die, and they know it, and they see it every day. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some examples of entrepreneurship in this environment that I've seen, okay? Some of them are gonna be small uh, things that are you know, doable by you. Some of them are be gonna be big things, but again, it, you know, it takes a larger skill set, uh, maybe more time, but still doable by people in this class. So the first example I want to get is a, a friend of mine named Steve Braun. So I met Steve uh, early 1990s when he was working as a contractor. And Steve was talking about bringing uh, somebody in who's doing some contract work and consulting work. So he was working as a contractor consultant in our organization. I was in charge in all the, uh, the R&D manufacturing quality systems. My counterpart was in charge of commercial systems. So Steve worked on that commercial side of the business and he was working with the marketing folks, you know? And my view of marketing folks was, boy, there's the loose cannons over there, okay? They can't follow a business process. They don't know what they want. You know, they're the, the people people. You know, they're not the data people. But Steve worked with those folks to figure out how to uh, basically do uh, uh, customer intelligence, uh, data analytics, those kinds of things. So he's an early innovator in that er area. So Steve was by himself. He hired another person, another person, built his client's base. The punchline is Steve's company, uh, Braun Consulting, was in, uh, acquired in 2004 with a $30 million payout. And uh, uh, my 30 million, oh, there's my $30 million payout. So Steve did pretty well, starting as a loan consultant doing uh, in, uh, business intelligence and data analytics for my company and being a, a pioneer in that area, okay? So that's one example of how an entrepreneur got started working within a business. Okay, so I was involved in a large SAP implementation, actually the biggest one we've ever, we ever did. And I'm sitting in a meeting and somebody says, oh, we have to allocate X, X amount of money for back office associates. And I said, what's back office associates, right? Now what do they do? And I looked it up, researched it, and heard what they do is they take data out of the old systems you're migrating from, putting that data into the new systems that you're migrating to, okay? So for us to do that work, we do that one time and it's a throwaway. And guess what? We're not gonna put our best people on it. So is it worth for us to hire back office associates? Heck yeah. 
So they would port, extract it from the old system, convert it, load it, do data quality. Did some research on back office associates. They had built an entire business model out of doing data porting. Now, I make it sound like you just dump the data out of moving it over, but you, you extract it, you have to cleanse it. Sometimes you have to clean the data up, like are these customers, they sound like they have the same name or the same customer, those kinds of things. So you have to do data quality work on it and then load it in your new system. So you have to know the old system, you have to know those data quality tools, you have to own those data quality tools and you have to port it to new systems. So they made a, a business, a very viable business model out of what I would consider to be the less attractive work we do as an IT organization, okay? They built a business on it. So where's the punchline? They started the company in 1996, did some buying and selling of the company, but in August of 2017, Goldman Sachs uh, sold by, uh, back office associates to uh, bridge growth for th and valued the, 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 the company at $300 million, okay? So again, an example of entrepreneurship coming in, finding a part of a business process which was undervalued for any one company but very valuable as a service for that company. And if you spread those costs out and expertise out across a large base, it became a very valuable business. And the other thing they did is they followed a trend of these large enterprise systems implementations where we were implementing SAP, large ERP systems in our corporation and they would just follow those deals around. So their innovation was growing a new service, process methods and technologies across multiple clients and leveraging a growing market for large enterprise systems, okay? All right. Um, okay, I wanna talk a little bit about sourcing and I'll go to my teacher mode just for a second and I'll teach you a few things. So sourcing, so why is sourcing so important? Well, you think, when I started out, you know, software developers, like we like built the whole thing, okay? Now, you know, you're either a front-end guy, you're a back-end guy, you have a database management system, you have a GUI you work with. So those were provided for you. If you're building a car, you don't necessarily go mine the metal, you don't make the metal, you generally assemble equipment. So sourcing about is figuring out what you do best, what is core to your business, and the rest, you know, you want its price value, right? You want to get it for a good price and you want a good service. So if you're looking to do some outsourcing or start a sourcing business, you want to find those processes that aren't core to companies, but they need to be done well. So, and there's a quote from this uh, book I use in my class. Whenever world-class providers can find enough customers desiring the same process, companies will have no reason to retain these processes internally, okay? So if I'm a pharmaceutical company and I have an accounts payable function, all I want is accurate processing of data. I don't care where it's done, I, at the best price, okay? So if somebody can source that function for me, I'm happy. Outsourcing those capabilities that don't distinguish you competitively frees up management to focus on those activities that differentiate your company and grow your profitability. So if you have a management team, you want them focusing on, focusing on competitive advantage, not necessarily processes that you can source. So this creates, this is why we've had all these third party sourcing companies grow, creates a great opportunity. And I put this together, now coming from an IT organization, I put this chart together for my students and I call it the IT commodity scale. So things at the bottom, you want to source those things, okay? Because they add no value to your, your operation and for you to put management time in those things, it's kind of wasted. Things at the top is what you want to do. What are things at the top? New business opportunities, I'll talk about that. Competitive advantage for your, for your business. Ownership, partner management, security. Those are the things you want to own. PC installs and support, network operations, data center operations, let's outsource those things, okay? Because I can't do them the best as a single IT entity, but people that pool those together can become world-class and give me world-class pricing. All right, and the big things in this last part of the lecture is the thing that's coming up against IT leaders is digitization. And I, I talked about that where companies need to figure out how to wrap their products and services with IT technology to make them more valuable. And there's a question, yes? Security.
Okay, um, I'm putting them lower down in the, uh, in, in the spectrum. I agree with you on security, security is key, but running a data center, uh, doing your networks operations and even uh, network design, I can't keep that kind of expertise in my organization, okay? I can manage third party suppliers and, and hopefully have some knowledge of what they're doing, but it's better for me to buy that service than to try to build an organization, okay? Why security, why security out there? Why security out there? Yeah, uh, let's why, ask. Why security needs to be retained in terms of Okay, I'm, I'm not saying where to draw the line. My, my point is I would draw the line up higher than lower, but I would personally, uh, I would draw the line at data strategy and go up. You know, for my organization, if I were really big time. And why does security, because Right now, I, I talk all about digitization and adding big value and business opportunities, but if you can't uh, block and tackle, if you can't keep your organization and your data secure, uh, you know, ask Equivax, you know, ask Target, you know, the huge hits for their businesses, okay, and their business models. So I would still source a lot of technical expertise in products and services, but as a CIO, I would want to have extremely strong ownership of my security, okay? Even my operations, okay? I want strong ownership of that, but I don't need to own all the people and the expertise and the facilities to do that, okay? But I still have to make sure it's delivered well, okay? Thank you for the question. All right, so let's talk about Cognizant. Uh, Cognizant is an outsourcing outfit uh, founded in 1994 as a spin-out from an in-house technology unit of Dun & Bradstreet. So you had Dun & Bradstreet, and I know exactly what happened. I wasn't there, but I can tell you what now. You had some guys there who were knowledgeable, hey, a lot of good programmers in India, let's let them do some support and maintenance for us. Dun & Bradstreet guys say, whoa, you sure? Yeah, I think we can save some money, I think we can do things quicker. Okay, so all right, let's give it a shot. So they started building this in-house organization with onshore, offshore resources. 1994, they got talked into spinning that out as a separate technology business, okay? He said, hey, we can grow this, we can make some money uh, by sharing these costs and doing these services from other people. They IPO'd in 1998. They joined the Fortune 500 in 2011. They came into my world around 2005, 2006, 2007, somewhere in there, okay? We became one of their early life science uh, clients. I got the most, uh, meet most of the leadership of this company. And we started, oh, I'll, I'll, sh I'll, I'll tell you more about how we started in the next slide. But uh, in 2011, they joined the Fortune 500. In 2015, they were named the fourth best, most admired IT services company by Fortune. And in 2016, their total annual, annual revenues are $13 billion, okay? So how did, remember that curve I showed you? that disruptors, disruption curve. Okay, how did Cognizant start out with us? Small maintenance contracts, okay? Small development projects, bigger maintenance contracts, bigger development projects. You're seeing them move up the curve, right? Then they started, hey, you know, we can support your software, we can develop some of your software, we know your business pretty well. We've got this BPO center, Business Process Outsourcing Center in India where we've got people that will do your accounts payable, do your clinical data analysis, whatever. We'll do that for you at a better price and a better service level than you can do it for yourself. So people start jumping on the bandwagon, okay? Um, okay, I'm gonna hurry here. Uh, they start building products. So they become very successful by, uh, by uh, going from the low end of that disruptive technology curve all the way up they start out being low cost and nimble with an onshore, offshore US India model, and they, they, they knock out people at the top end, okay? So you've seen this, and so you can see how Cognizant went up. Think about the other folks that we talked about. Okay, and Frank DeSosa, too busy to meet. Frank DeSosa is the president of Cognizant. He's also on the board of General Electric now. Very successful person. Okay, the birth of giants. So I wanna do this. Uh, uh, kind of quickly here, but just to, so you can see how entrepreneurs worked in the, um, uh, in, the, in the enterprise system space. A few definitions, ERP is process and systems for like enterprise functions like finances, order management, 
customer service, enterprise cus uh, processes for managing your customers or sales process processes, SAP, a German company that provides ERP systems, Oracle uh, is a company that provides relational database management systems, enterprise class software like ERP, and life sciences are like pharmaceutical biotech companies. Okay, so I'm going to go through this a little quickly. All right. So EFCOD was an IBMer, was an IBMer, proposes a relational data model, which was a great model for working with data, building big databases, most of the systems you know run, run on this. Larry Ellison leaves Chicago, heads for Silicon Valley, where he begins working as a self-taught programmer for a couple of different companies, okay? He and some buddies get a contract from the CIA uh, to build a database for the CIA. They call it Oracle. They use EFCOD's relational model. IBM did not use EFCOD's model because they were protecting their existing business at the high end. Larry came at the low end with the Oracle model, built Oracle, punchline, $37 billion company today, okay? Commercialized new technology was their innovation, all right? SAP did business processes and systems for finances order management, okay? A guy named uh, Tom Siebel left Oracle, starts a company called Siebel CRM, does processes and systems for customer relationship management. I'm thinking like, you can't get those guys together. Those salespeople are crazy. They don't know what they're doing. Tom figures out a way to make those repeatable business processes. Starts Oracle, okay? Or, I mean, starts Siebel, CRM. Oracle then, a couple of years later, buys Siebel systems back, all right? Why? Because they're trying to build out their product offering to do not just databases, but enterprise class systems to compete with SAP, okay? So they want Siebel CRM. All right, so Tom took it to new business processes, okay? Mark Banioff leaves Oracle in 1999. What does he do? He starts Salesforce.com, which is basically CRM, but now based in the cloud. Is it as good as Siebel when it launches? No, okay? Is it good enough to attract low-end customers, start going up that disruption chain, okay? Yes, it is. Now the largest CRM company in the world Current uh, total sales is $6.67 billion, okay? All right, part three. A gentleman by the name of, of Matt leaves Siebel where he grew the life sciences business. One of the top tech, tech guys from salesforce.com leaves. They start a company, it's called Viva Systems. I watch this because we, we use Viva Systems. What is Viva Systems? It's a, it's a customization built on top of salesforce.com that is unique to the life sciences business. So it makes Siebel CRM much more friendly for use by life sciences. The IBPO in 2013, 2017 sales, or I think actually that's 2016 sales, $500 million, okay? So they built on Salesforce technology. The, who are their customers? They go after the Salesforce customers, all right? All right, and then I wanted to do this quick one, which is uh, to kind of homegrown here. But Dave Duffy starts PeopleSoft, which is now the business process is HR, okay? So Bill builds PeopleSoft. Oracle acquires it because they want to tie it up with their other offerings to be a bigger enterprise supplier, okay? What happens? Oracle acquires it in 2004. Dave Duffy starts Workday, which is PeopleSoft in the cloud in 2005, okay? I don't know the current enterprise value or sales of Workday, but Workday opens their Salt Lake City office in 2014. Okay, so it's a local company for you guys. So you can now see what I'm talking about, right? It's not just what you start in the garage, it's what you can do for helping big businesses grow their process, innovate with new technology, new business processes, start out in consulting and drive new businesses. Okay, so we've kind of talked about that. Uh, there's some other ways. Um, that I've seen, or how are we doing? We're out of time? Okay, let me show my last slide. All right. Okay, this is the most important thing I've done in my life. Okay, this is my family, all right? This is spiritual roots of entrepreneurship, okay? For the earth is full and there's enough in despair. And yea, I have prepared all things that have been given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Organize yourself and prepare every needful thing. This is what we're doing, we're teaching people how to fish. We're hiring people into our operation. We're creating new jobs, okay? 
The well, I, I was had the opportunity to meet a lot of wealthy people in Chicago. The wealthiest man I ever met said <clears throat> his mission in life was to funnel mark money from the financial markets of the world to the church. And these are some of the things that we can do as entrepreneurs as we build new businesses, and there's treasure everywhere. Thank you.